No? Okay. So um, I will be moving on to our next seventh and the last, but never the least, speaker for today's evening, um, architect Susil Lamaheva. He is a chartered architect with his own individual practice, mainly focused on residential, retreats, and institutional buildings. His special interests are on recycling building materials and components, and he loves the concept of earthy architecture and is a great teacher, and in fact, he was one of my mentors as well when I was studying at CSA. He loves to travel and sketch, and was also the editor in SLIA magazine Vastu from 2005 up to 2008. He is also a green associate professional at ASL Consultants, and his topic today would be architecting the old to new. I just saw architect Susila around. Ah, architect Susila, hey, over to you. Thank you, uh, past president, uh, architect Russell Dandania, and I can see Sumudu and whole lot of my friends and colleagues, my dear architects and uh, dear friends. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, today, I am going to talk about architecting the old to new, the meaning Architect is a noun. When you put it to a verb in action, I would say it is architecting. The meaning of old to new actually happened because of this pandemic situation. I think we were all locked down in con uh, houses and countries were locked down and everybody had various problems. And because of that, there was a kind of a recession in the world. People got uh, kind of lost their jobs and had difficult times. Now it is the post-mortem and everybody is, you know, kind of without jobs. And especially in Sri Lanka, due to our crisis, most of us are trying to survive with available projects. Therefore, I have realized in future there will be a lot of renovations, conservations, reconstructions, and, you know, kind of restoring old buildings for use. Therefore, I think it's a timely uh, topic, you know, architecting the old to new. The architecture is a way of design and supervise the construction of buildings or other structures. Or rather, it is everybody, all of us have uh, we know it is, uh, it is a uh, problem-solving procedure, it's an architecture. But this, the word architecting is mainly used by the information technology field and they go by design and configure a program or system, which is like, you know, you are using the whole context to solve a problem within no minutes. This is the kind of, uh, you know, it's blending the old and new. So that's my topic today. So when I say old, so I'm trying to talk about renovations. So under renovations, you can see there are conservations, repurposing of buildings. For example, if you have a large house, you can repurpose it as two houses maybe, or maybe you can repurpose it to another function. 
So through this uh, talk, within this uh, short period, I am trying to showcase two case studies uh, done by me. Uh, and you know, the buildings decay when you don't use it, you know. The causes of decay is one is gravity, and then you have the action of man and the climate and environment. The, the most common and universal uh, causes of decay is gravity, that is to say natural disasters such as earthquakes, floods, and uh, volcanic uh, eruptions, they are, they, you know, they are due to gravity. And then the action of man, if you neglect the building or if you ignorance or vandalism and fire and also again sometimes you know you get other uh, damages to the building by man. The final one is climate and the environment you know due to radiation the temperature moisture fungi wind and snow also can add to this uh, decay so therefore we need to maintain the buildings otherwise they'll go decay. And then we have uh, the values of these buildings. I'm talking about the history, the historic buildings. So they have either architectural value, aesthetic value, or historic value. On the other side, you have the archaeological value or economical and social value of the building. Finally, we'll have a political value or spiritual value or a symbolic value of a building. I know you are getting bored about this now. I'm talking like a, like a you know, just a talker, uh, nothing to show. but. But you know, your, your emotions towards buildings, emotional values, and we have a culture. Any, any society has a culture, and therefore we have cultural values. These cultural values direct you to heritage. And then you have symbolic values. And all these, what I'm talking about, the history and the monuments and the things like that, you know, if society want them, they will keep them. If society do not want them, they will destroy them. So this is other than those causes of decay. The society request all buildings or the historic buildings to remain there, or society will say, we do not want this. So then they will destroy it. That is how the world runs. Look at this. The society, the whole world said this is a world monument. It is a, a heritage, the culture of those people, this Bahmin Buddha statues than in 12th to 14th century, but finally what happened? The society did not want it. The, the, the current culture, the context, today, they do not want it. So what did they do? They destroyed it, and we don't have it anymore. It was a UNESCO monument. The whole world said, do not do anything to this. This has a value, it has a cultural value, the historical value, and, and it could represent Afghanistan, but what happened at the end of the day? People did not want it and they destroyed it. Now this one, this is a Dutch monument or Dutch fort in Jaffna. They were almost destroyed due to a 30 year war, the civil war in the country, but protected. People want to protect this. That is the power of society. Look at this building. Sri Lanka. So this building, the previous one, we have it. We still have it because society want it. This is the famous Disoisa building. Now, the COVID pandemic came into the country here and we were locked down. During the same time, there was a huge debate in the country whether to keep this building or not. We have a register of listed buildings in the country. If your building or any monument or any artifact is older than 100 years, or if they are older than, uh, older than uh, March 2nd of 1815, then they are automatically listed buildings or monuments in the country. But this building was just 100 years on the day, on the year, that it was destroyed. So, but the, but the, the point is here now, the, the learned society or the universities, the schools of architecture, architecture students, and the professionals knew the value of this building. I think it was the only curved building in uh, Peta, and it's at, it was at Malay Street. We got COVID, and then just before COVID slipped 
Egypt uh, School of Architecture did some measured drawing and CSA Colombo School of Architecture did some measured drawing of these kind of details. It was a colonial building and you can still see things there. And they started measuring, you know, they did measured drawings. And then finally, we were under lockdown due to COVID pandemia here. And there was curfew and this is what happened. So nobody knew. Nobody knew during the, during the, uh, the curfew, lockdown and all of the you can't go out, we lost the building. And that is the COVID-19 pandemic what gave us. So we lost that building. And how do we control the COVID-19? By lockdown. And then you have care centers provided by the government. And then we had intermediate care centers, the stations in various places in the country. <coughs> and then COVID-19 hospitals. So my case studies, as I told you, <coughs> my case studies, I have selected two case studies. One is a hospital at Tanamalvila. Tanamalvila city was, <coughs> Tanamalvila city uh, during the pandemia, during the COVID, COVID period, it was a hot spot. That was the doctor's language. It was a hot spot in uh, a COVID in this country. They wanted something. So Tanamalvila had the Sarvode center, district center. They had a huge set of buildings uh, which they occupied for their various uh, activities. That was a higher learning education center of Tanamalvila at that district. They, uh, they wanted to convert some of the buildings to make a 50 bed hospital. Finally, we can't move, we were locked down. Everything happened over the phone and, uh, and using social media, emails, WhatsApp pictures, and things like that. So the, the, the transmission of drawings and the sketches were through WhatsApp and emails. Could not visit. We were not allowed to go out of your city. But the Thanamalil Hospital has only two wards, about 20 beds. The number of COVID patients were more than 500. And Sarvodhya came forward and asked me, what can we do? We have a set of buildings, but no toilets, no sanitary facilities. So immediately I said, we will do something. So the Sarvode center was across the, the uh, across a river actually. They have started these buildings in 1950s and they are still standing, underutilized some areas. Uh, so these are the two pictures. This is how you go to Tanamalvila Sarvode center. The picture on the picture on the left here. This is built in 1950s and later they put a bridge right next to the, the cable bridge. And then I will just take you through some pictures. All these pictures that I'm going to show you today are not captured by photographers or architects or at least the people who knew photography. They are all taken by mason bars, carpenters, and you know, the people who were on site because it was a remote controlled project. Uh, all this happens during the pandemia. This is the master plan. They did not have any drawings. So we asked them to measure the buildings externally and get the distance between two buildings. So this is what we came up. It was pretty accurate. And they did not have a toilet facilities because it, it was not a hospital. Now we are trying to create a hospital. All these yellow patches are, all these yellow patches are new toilets. This is a new toilet block, new toilet block, new toilet block, and this is a large auditorium, new toilet block, and a new toilet block here. The, the blue line gives you the, the partition area where COVID patients uh, will be stations during the, 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 the COVID period, or you call it the ICC, Intermediate Care Center. And we had to have a, a mortuary, temporary mortuary, and incinerator, and there were so many problems with the doctor, you know, 
uh, uh, the, the, the MOH doctor visited the site and you know they request this and that and the other we had to obey to all those rules but uh, we kind of managed to do this phase one with 50 bed hospital after two weeks they got another 50 beds and it was a hundred bed hospital we managed to do this within 40 days I will show you some pictures now this is the building that we got these are the partitions because we are partitioning the whole of uh, halls and the wards you know we were taking lecture rooms as wards entrance lobby as the ICU unit and the entrance foyer as the doctor's station and then there are, there are laborers quarters as the doctor's quarters and the nurses quarters and the medical drug stores this is the main hall we turn the main hall this has very limited lighting then we had to put in new light system here so we did that all remote you know I, I am in Colombo Sarvo there is in uh, Moratua and they have their people at site so contractor was selected from the same area and then this is what uh, when the beds were there this is 50 bed ward and after fixing some lights this is the entrance lobby of Sarvodaya Institute at Tanamalvila and then we moved all the furniture and the lobby uh, furniture and this was supposed to be the, the ICU kind of uh, intensive care patients they had only three beds and Sarvodaya has international connections they, they I think sent uh, invitations to help for this hospital after one week we got three ICU beds completed and then these are the new toilets that uh, we plugged in between the wards actually they were lecture rooms so then from both sides you can reach this and the interior of the toilets this is all remote control you know you were working day and night carpenters were working day and night so it took only about 40 days or maximum 45 days and hospital was open during the peak of the pandemia and in between the in between the wards there were la lady wards and gents wards and they wanted the privacy for their the cloth drying and the toilet facility and all of them so we actually I used this screen wall in between and then I gave them the open shower areas because uh, they said people have to uh, uh, walk and do all these exercises so they had to walk to these areas here the trees were remained they were all retained we did not cut any tree the everything was done around the tree without visiting the site looking at the Google pictures the pictures sent by the laborers and the carpenters and the masons and these are the all screens here and they are just to make their privacy it is a hundred and ten bed hospital made within 45 days and it was in full swing until the COVID was uh, kind of eradicated from the country and these are the meetings that they had after the after the, the travel ban was lifted and in the MOH the Ministry of Health moved in they took the hospital over they brought all these medicines here you can see all of this happened and then uh, when doctors go inside the hospital from their quarters they are not supposed to come back on the same route it's a circuit and then they had to go out through this shed kind of a building and they remove their clothes have a shower have a hot shower and then get new clothes new shoes and walk out then you are not allowed in here so finally we had to put up a small shed for the ambulance and that was right at the entrance and this is how it looks like so that was my first case study so what I what I was trying to prove you you don't need to go to site these days there is technology and there is uh, social media that you can use the communication is so high so I did not visit this site until it is uh, completed and uh, you know it was in full swing finally all these beds and the ICU units were handed over to the uh, General Hospital Tanamalvila and the next project next case study is in Poland in 19, 2019 I got a call from a friend of mine who is living in UK he wanted to uh, he wanted to select a place for his retirement there was a question 
come back to Sri Lanka or live in UK or go to Poland. Those are the three destinations he used. Finally, we had the kind of a sort and then uh, the sort directed us to Poland. Then he started looking for projects, uh, kind of buildings, half done buildings, abandoned buildings or empty plots and we spent about uh, six, seven months and then COVID came. So my site visit was canceled. I cannot go to Poland, project was on hold. 2020, mid, airplanes started moving from country to country and then immediately he went to Poland and found a very old building. And the Polish lady wanted to renovate this building so that they can uh, do uh, Airbnb kind of a thing. So they need, the old building is about 250 years old and it had only one bathroom in the ground floor and one bathroom in the upper floor. They wanted separate bathrooms, attached bathrooms, lockable rooms. There's a river run by this plot uh, and it's a rural area. It's about, uh, I think, 150 kilometers away from the, the Warsaw or Warsaw, they call it. And this is the railway station. I think I love that building. And also, the building that they found is this. So the history of the building is actually, uh, they had only one building like this, the green color. So they had the underground area as a basement. And there was a hatch here at the plinth level. And you can go down to the basement from here. On top of that, you have a granary. So this is where they store their harvest, uh, which is uh, rye, barley, and you know all of wheat. And this is the potato storage underground because of the temperature, the, the extreme temperatures they store potatoes underground. Later, I found they store their cows here, cow shed. We have a cow shed in our country, but in this cold climate, temperature goes down to minus 20 Celsius. All the cows were inside here, and they had the hearth here, and the firewood was somewhere in this area. So this actually, the, the Polish lady did not know. I had to analyze back how this uh, building has uh, come up. This is my analysis or chronology. This is, uh, they find it's 1900 or 1890. That is the time the, the village was developed there. And it's a small village uh, uh, by a river. This house faces the river, but there are no windows towards the river. The interesting part is during the summer, they do kayaking in this river. And during the winter, on the upstream of the river, it's a sky, uh, ski, ski joint. So they go to do their skiing. That is why they bought this property. So the chronology of the building is, you know, you have a cellar and the ground floor. And then around 1920, they had bought cows and there was a room for cows. So it was an agricultural building. These are all agricultural land. So it was an agricultural building to harvest their, their, their harvest and to tie their cows. The garden had become a, a wheat a plantation and an orchard. Around 1930, we found all these dates actually from their iron mongery, the, the, the electrical fittings, because I get down all the pictures, then I say, okay, look where, where it is built and the date or the year, so we found them. And the phase three, they had this uh, five, six, four toilet. Phase four, they had the upper floor with a small attic. So that is how the building chronology works here. This is the, the measured drawing I did in Sri Lanka, getting down all the dimensions from, from a doctor friend and this uh, Polish lady. They sent me all wrong drawings. And then by looking at the pictures and through video calls, WhatsApp video calls, and uh, you know, lot of, uh, lot of with a lot of problems, I managed to get this down. This is the proposed plan for the phase one. The, this area was one room. They had to go through the living room, entry foyer to the toilet. 
and they did not have a door here to go to the backyard. They did not have a window here to view the river. And this was the cow room. There were, there were little, little rings on the wall. Then I asked them, what are those rings? They did not know. So they asked the castle people or they asked neighbors and they said there were cows living in that room. And this is the, 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 the granary and this is the, the space going down to the basement. There's a hatch here to put the potatoes in. So this is how it was there. And this is the cow room, actually. This is the cow room, as I found. And then at one point, we cleaned the ceiling. This is what we find. It's a very shallow arch made out of brick. That is so interesting. And there were wall cracks. And then when I asked this contractor whether they can do the wall stitching, they knew the technology, so we stitched the walls. We stapled the walls. And then uh, they had uh, the old staircase, uh, which was painted in brown and, you know, done various things. Then we scratched, and then we got it back to the original position. And we found the old tiles are so simple, uh, pleasing to your eye, and we asked them not to remove anything. So what I, my message is actually, when you, re, when you reconstruct or when you rebuild, or renovate buildings, you do not have to demolish all of those. This is without kind of, with minimum demolition of the building, I wanted to preserve this, conserve this 250 year old building. What they wanted was to demolish part of that and bring, plug in new, new uh, rooms, bathrooms, you know, just to uh, rent out and you know, it look new. And then I explained them, this is like a book. The book is, the, the house is like a book. You can read chapter by chapter. Just imagine 1800s building until 2020 today. And they are still working. And the next picture shows, uh, they are all, the, the, the construction is actually still going on. They just moved into one room. So this was the, the, the hearth area here. So that's why all this is black, like a black kitchen here. So it was a firewood, uh, a firewood uh, a burner here for running hot water the, the, for the heating system. This window was there. This is where the cows were tied up here. And I turned this to a, a pantry and a small dining room so that they can rent out a part of the house. And this is the, the uh, this is actually going to the attic from the first floor. Uh, we haven't done anything yet, except, uh, except the one room in the attic. So on the left hand side, you can see the attic, how it was, this is the chimney going, running up. So the room under the attic is this actually. And then finally, uh, towards the, the river, by this side, uh, we open windows and doors. All of them have uh, not double glazing, triple glazing because uh, the, the temperature goes down so much. And then uh, this is the deck now going on at the back with the low, uh, shallow roof. Uh, and that is how I think I salvaged the old building here. And this is uh, during the summer, the front of the building is unchanged. Though the interior of the building is kind of changed with minimum intervention. That is what you should do. With minimum intervention, if you can, if you can uh, do renovations or upgradements and repurposing the buildings, that is what all architects should do actually. So uh, 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 I think uh, the, the, my message is actually, like those days, we do not have to go to site and, uh, and, and do the supervision on site, but without doing that, you can achieve some some uh, uh, something you know like uh, you can achieve what you want to achieve so this is the ongoing project so those are my two small uh, the projects or the case studies that i wanted to to show you uh, all this happened during the pandemic so if you have any questions i would answer i hope there are no questions and thank you so much for listening to me
Yes, please. There's a question. Yes, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Cecil, uh, for a very, uh, very important topic. And uh, I think it is, uh, we call uh, uh, all this all is gold, right? Uh, so that's uh, saying like that. And uh, Ms. Seneca also mentioned that, uh, try to elaborate that, uh, what is the importance of the old uh, architect and things and uh, what they have practiced earlier and uh, what we are now practicing. Um, I have a small question that uh, when you're talking about old buildings, um, is that uh, other than uh, what the engineers are enhancing, uh, that initial stage at uh, the original designs, are you considering this uh, disaster uh, resistance buildings like uh, disaster resistance. Is there any input that architect can do uh, for the disaster uh, resistance like uh, for example earthquakes and we saw that uh, during our uh, tsunami time there were some buildings, old buildings with different shapes they were survived and some of the latest buildings even with uh, uh, good design with the structural designs has collapsed sometimes and even with recent uh, uh, this Turkey uh, earthquake, and uh, in 2015, uh, Nepal, uh, the earthquake, we still see that uh, the old buildings are still, you know, remaining without having much problems like that. Um, I was here in Nepal last uh, two weeks back, and I saw, I visited uh, some of these uh, old buildings, and they were survived, and uh, according to my understanding, the feedback I got from some of the experts there, uh, the new buildings collapsed, but the old buildings uh, very much survived uh, compared to the new buildings. So is there any things that architect are, uh, you know, taking in as input to, uh, you know, this uh, disaster resistance uh, buildings and, the, you know, kind of uh, architect? Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, I think the answer is a double barrel answer, so it's, it's my fault. One is, in today's context, uh, we all go by the codes. So we go by the structural codes, and architects don't have formulas, right? Architecture is so. But we are adhered to answer to the engineer's questions. The engineering designs will actually look after the, the, the earthquakes in your say. So now we cannot produce, I think, earthquake-proofed buildings. That's a natural disaster. But we can resist to a certain level. It is a this is a structural engineer's uh, question that, that I am answering. But these old buildings, either in Sri Lanka, India, or in Poland, that what I found in this, uh, in this uh, also if you realize, uh, this is how I managed to uh, get the age of the building also. Now the, the, the first, the initial building here, the, all the walls were 450 millimeters thick. And the basement, we don't know the thickness. It may be more. So it, has a st it is already stabilized. It's already, it's already, I think, anchored to the ground, and it has only one floor above. So then it can withstand kind of, I think, it's stable enough. The next set of uh, walls are here. They are all 350 millimeter thickness. This is how we analyzed backwards this building. And the later, this part is actually 220 or 250 millimeter thick walls. So the answer, the ancient buildings, you know, they are all earth buildings. And earth is the best material, not concrete. Concrete has only about, you know, less than 100 years. Uh, the India, yes. Not on the university yeah. in India, like yeah. big, uh, the yeah, the big even walls. even even uh, even our country, all all Valauas, if you take the the walls are about 18 inches, 24 inches, you know. Sometimes you go to Middle East, the walls are four feet. Walls are four feet thick. I relocated one building. I was part of the team in Muscat, Oman, which was about 150 years old building. The the ground floor walls were four feet wide. And then first floor was about three and a half feet wide. So, so the natural stability was given by the materials, by the architects. So th there is no nonsense, right? You know, they don't, they don't play with those. And they are earth buildings to resist the heat from outside to inside. 
and uh, and I, I I agree with you because old buildings are more resistant to the the natural disasters than the new buildings because we are now going by the technology, we are now going by the calculations. I think, and 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 now it is a uh, group work. Those days it was, you know, it was master builder. So master builder tells with experience, with his experiments, and the craftsmen come and do it. That's how it was built those days. But now. It has gone all over. Now you know there are so many professions, and and everybody has a part in it. And uh, therefore, I think uh, we sometimes maybe we at uh, at a disaster again. Uh, did I answer your question? Building, you know, as uh, per the uh, our material scarcity, we are considering a lot of uh, material problems now. You know, scarcity, and so we are going to economize. But the structural engineers are doing their best to. Uh, you know, technologically give you answers. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, then part two would be maybe the, the obsolete cycle of a building. The, the old buildings, you know, Anuradhapura, almost all the buildings are still surviving after, after restoration or, or, or conservation. But new buildings, they go by. So I think uh, that is where the we can, uh, 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 I think that's the answer is there. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much.